Okay, so this is lesson 13, I believe. And I had said on uh, Monday that um, I actually, this is going to be a short class today. We will finish uh, uh, before 10 o'clock. Um, and let me start as always by asking if there are any questions. I had sent, there'll be two review sheets for the exam. The first review sheet I uh, posted yesterday. Uh, the second, which is on uh, uh, symmetric groups and, and matrix groups, uh, I'll post uh, in a day or two and I'll be able to go over both of them on Monday. Um, but I am certainly happy right now to answer <coughs> Any questions you might have about anything? Um, how many questions will be in the exam? Um, I don't know. How many would you like? I don't know. <laughs> oh. So they're usually, uh, you know, eight to ten questions. There's always usually some extra credit in there included as well. So. Uh, you can still get 100 on the exam if you don't do every single question. And you can get extra credit if you do everything. So let's just review a couple of the things that we did on Monday. So we look at congruences uh, modulo M. And one of the important results has to do with when can you solve a linear congruence? AX congruent to B mod M. And this has a solution if and only if B is divisible by the greatest common divisor of A and M. So if you want to solve the congruence um, 14x congruent to 7 mod um, 22, you say, well, let's see, A is 14, B is 22. The greatest common divisor of 14 and 22 is 2. B is seven and seven is not divisible by two. Seven is not congruent to zero mod two, therefore no solution to this congruence. If we had to solve the congruence 14x congruent to seven mod 21. In this case, A is 14, M is 21. The greatest common divisor of A and M, oops, this should have been an M here, M. Greatest common divisor of A and M is the greatest common divisor of 14 and 21, which is seven. B is seven. And seven is congruent to zero mod seven. So solutions exist. So that means there exists an X that satisfies this congruence. So you can find X and Y such that 14x minus seven is a multiple of 21. So we know that we can solve this congruence. Let's see, let's just do it. 14x minus seven equals 21y. If you divide by seven, you get two x minus one is three y or two x minus three y equals one. It's easy to find a solution of this. For example, x equal two, y equal one is a solution. Okay. 14 times two 
minus seven is 28, minus seven is 21, is divisible by seven. So x equal two is a solution. And it follows that if you take any x congruent to two, my 21, then x is another solution. Of course, the solutions of congruences lie in congruence classes. Suppose we actually ask, can we find all solutions? So we know two is a solution and we know that every integer congruent to two mod 21 is a solution, like 23, right? Let's just check. X equal 23 is congruent to two mod 21. So 14 times 23, what's 14 times 23? Anyone know? 322. 322. So 322 minus seven is 315, I think. Is this divisible by 21? Let's see. Yeah, it is. So this is 21 times 15. So 14 times 23 is congruent to seven mod 21. So th this means that we have infinitely many solutions, but it still doesn't mean that we have them all. Hmm. So we could ask, is there a solution that's not congruent to two mod 21? So let's go back and look at the congruence again. So 14x is congruent to seven mod 21, if and only if there is a y such that 14x minus seven is 21y, which is the same, if you divide by seven, is the same as two x minus one equals three y, which is the same as saying two X is congruent to one mod three. And this is the only solution of this. If you try X equals zero, it doesn't work. X equal one doesn't work, but X equal two does work. So if and only if X is congruent to two mod three. So what are numbers that are congruent to two mod three? Two, five, eight, 11, 14. I want numbers that are congruent to two mod three and not congruent um, mod 21. 17, 20. One, two, three, four, five. There seem to be seven of them. So the solution we found the first time was two. What about five? Let's just double check. Remember our congruence is 14 X congruent to seven modulo 21. So let's try X equal five. So 14 times five is 70. So 14 times five minus seven, seven is 70 minus seven is 63 is 21 times three. So five also works. And you can check that eight, 11, 14, 17, 21, 
these all work. And these are in different congruence classes, modulo 21. So in fact, if you wanted to find all solutions of this congruence, all solutions, it consists of seven different congruence classes, modulo 21, or one congruence class mod three. It's the same thing. So finding all solutions of a congruence is an interesting problem. Okay. Any questions about that? So we also proved on Monday the Chinese remainder theorem. It tells us when we can solve two congruences simultaneously. So we want to solve x congruent to a mod m and x congruent to b mod n. We want to know when can we find one number that satisfies both conference congruences. So for example, suppose you wanted x congruent to 5 mod 7 and x congruent to 3 mod 11. Can you find one number that satisfies these two congruences simultaneously? So if x is congruent to 5 mod 7, then x has to be of the form 5 plus 7y for some y. So if x is also congruent to 3 mod 11 and x is of this form, then 5 plus 7y has to be congruent to 3 mod 11 which means five plus seven y minus three is some multiple of 11. Or let me just make it easier. Seven y is congruent to three minus five or minus two mod 11. This, does this have a solution? Well, this is of the form a y congruent to b mod m, where a is 7, b is minus 2, m is 11. The greatest common divisor of 7 and 11 is 1. So this has a solution. This has a solution. Um, how do you find a solution? I don't know. You just um, play around until you do. You could say, uh, I mean, you could just do trial and error, but um, let's see, seven modulo 11, this is the same as minus four y congruent to minus two mod 11, because minus four is congruent to seven. And if you don't like minus signs, you multiply by minus one, you get four y is congruent to two mod 11. And if you're lucky, you see, well, y equals six is a solution because four times six is 24, take away two is 22, which is divisible by 11. So if y is six, x, which is five plus seven y is five plus 42 is 47. Let's just check. Try x equal 47. So forty seven minus five is forty two is seven times six. So this congruence is satisfied. forty seven minus three is forty four, which is eleven times four. So this congruence is satisfied. So 47 is a solution and any number X, which is congruent to 47, modulo the product of these two moduli, 77 will also be a solution. 
So. Question. Yes, sir. Could you repeat the last part where uh, you have like the last two equations, minus four y equal um, congruent to minus two? Yes. How did okay. you get that? All right, I'll show you. Very good question. So we have these two congruences, x congruent to five mod seven and x congruent to three mod 11. So if x is congruent to five mod seven, that means x is five plus some multiple of y. And if x is also three mod 11, that means five plus seven y is congruent to three mod 11. Or if I just rearrange this, seven y is congruent to three minus five or minus two mod 11, okay? And, <laughs> and now I'm just playing around and doing some arithmetic. I know that four plus seven is 11, right? So seven is congruent to minus four mod 11. So I can multiply, I mean, if seven is congruent to minus four, seven y is congruent to minus four y mod 11 for any integer y. So this is minus four y is congruent to minus two mod 11. And if I multiply by minus one, because I prefer positive numbers, y satisfies four y congruent to two mod 11. Let's see, what numbers are two mod 11? Two at 11, 23, at 11, sorry, at 11, 13, at 11, 24. This guy is divisible by four. So, So if I take y equals six, four y is four times six is 24, is congruent to two mod 11. So y equals six is one solution of this congruence. I know this congruence has a solution because four and 11 are relatively prime. And if y is equal to six, x is five plus seven y is five plus seven times six, is five plus 42 is 47. And so 47 is a solution. And any other solution will be divisible by both seven and 11. So any X which is congruent to 47 modulo the product of seven and 11, which is 77 will also be a solution. So, that's the idea. All right. So it does take some skill in algebra, right? But it's a course in algebra. So the way you develop these techniques are just to do a lot of problems, as many problems as you can find or invent. How would you solve <laughs> two sort of simultaneous linear congruences? Suppose you have something like three X congruent to one mod five and um, 4x congruent to um, minus 2 mod 7. So here we have two linear congruences, 
to different moduli and you want to see if you can find a common solution. So the first step would be to transform this into equations that look like x congruent to a mod five and x congruent to b mod seven. What does this mean? Well, it means solve these two equations separately first. So suppose we want to solve the congruence 3x congruent to one mod five. So the GCD of three and five is one. So this means this is going to have a unique solution modulo five. What is the solution? Well, what's the solution to this congruence? Can someone tell me? What's an integer x that satisfies this congruence? Two? Yeah, two. Three times two is six minus one is five. So this congruence has the solution x congruent to two mod five. What about the second congruence? Four x congruent to minus two mod seven. Again, the GCD of four and seven is one. So this will also have a unique solution mod seven. What's the solution of this? Two. Let's see, if you had x equal two, this is eight. Eight plus two is 10 is not divisible by seven. So x equal two doesn't work. Three. Sorry, what? Three. Three. So if you had x equal three, you get 12. 12 plus two is 14 is divisible by seven. So x equal three does work. So this set of two congruences is equivalent to x congruent to two mod five and x congruent to three mod seven. And by the Chinese remainder theorem, this pair of congruences does have a solution. Um, the question is, what is it? So, you can work it out in various ways. That's, but if you know a solution is three mod seven, so a solution is gonna be three or just keep adding seven, 10, 17, 24. Does, does any of these work? Well, I mean, they all work for this, but three isn't two mod seven. Ten isn't two. Ten minus two is eight. That's not that doesn't work. 17, uh huh. When you let x equal 17, 17 is minus two is uh, five. So if you let x equal 17, that's a solution. 17 minus three is 14, is two times seven. 17 minus two is 15, is three times five. So x equals 17 is a solution and anything congruent to 17 modulo the product of five and seven will work. So let's just check. I'm claiming that 17 is a solution of the original two congruences. So let's check. Three times 17 minus one, three times 17 is 51, minus one is 50, is five times 10. So three times 17 is congruent to one mod five. Four times 17 is minus one, is 68 minus one is, um, sorry, uh, is that right? Uh, oh, uh, minus, minus, minus two is, all right, because this is four x congruent to minus two. I so, cannot hear you right, Professor. So four times 17, minus minus two 
is 68 plus two is 70 is 70 times 10. So four times 17 is congruent to minus two mod seven. And we found the solution to the congruence. So you can solve two simultaneous linear congruences or determine whether or not there's a solution by solving the two congruences separately and then applying the Chinese remainder theorem. Professor? Yes. The part where you see um, x congruent to 17 mod 35, how do you get that? So I want to solve these two congruences, right? So <clears throat> let's just go review. If 3x is congruent to 1 mod 5, I solve that congruence. That's the same as x is congruent to 2 mod 5. 4x congruent to minus 2 mod 7, the solution is x congruent to 3 mod 7. So any number x that solves both of these congruences will also solve these two congruences. So here, I can now apply the Chinese remainder theorem, or at least The Chinese Ranger theorem tells me that these two congruences have a solution. And I found by trial and error that 17 is a solution. There are other ways to do it, but I just did it by trial and error. Any solution is three mod seven. So the numbers three mod seven are three, 10, 17, 24, 31, 38, 45, and so forth. And I just tried each of these numbers in turn. And I know eventually I'll get a solution. Three doesn't work, 10 doesn't work, but 17 did work. That's how I did it. Okay. Let's go back to the linear congruence. Suppose P is a prime number and we want to solve a congruence AX congruent to B modulo P. So this is solvable if and only if V is congruent to zero modulo the greatest common divisor of A and P. Now, the greatest common divisor of a prime with any number is either one or P. And it's equal to P precisely when P divides A. And it's equal to one precisely when P does not divide A. So if the GCD of A and P is one, then the congruence AX congruent to B mod P has a solution for all integers B. So in particular, you let B equal one, AX congruent to one, mod p as a solution. Let's actually work out the solution for some number. So suppose I take p equals seven and so what are the non-zero numbers mod p? One, two, three, four, five, and six. So for each possible value of A, 
I want to find x such that ax is congruent to 1 mod p. Well, if a is 1, you can just take x as 1. Well, it's 1 times 1 is congruent to 1 mod 7. What about if a is 2? 2 times what is congruent to 1 mod 7? Can someone tell me an answer? You want to solve 2x congruent to 1 mod 7. What should the x be? 12. If you had x equal 12, this is 24. Minus 1 is 23. Is not divisible by 7. Can you try 12? Well, just make it easier. Um, 24 also doesn't work. But uh, 4 works. If you let x equal 4, 2 times 4 is 8. 8 minus 1 is 7. So 2 times 4 is congruent to 1 mod 7. What about 3? What can you multiply 3 by to get a multiple of 7? 5. 3 times 5 is 15. Minus 1 is 14 is divisible by 7. And now you can fill in the rest of the table easily because if 2 times 4 is 1, 4 times 2 is 1. If 3 times 5 is 1, 5 times 3 is 1. And 6, well, what do you multiply 6 by? 6. Uh, 6, perfect. Because 6 times 6 is 36, minus 1 is 35. So here I found what we might call the inverses of each of these numbers, because this times this is always 1. So remember I described how we can go back and forth between congruences and congruence classes. So remember that the congruence class of A modulo M is the set, I write it as A plus MZ this is all the numbers that are congruent to a mod m. So a, a plus m, a plus 2m, a plus 3m, and so forth. And we could also go a, a minus m, a minus 2m, a minus 3m. This is the congruence class of a mod m. And z mod mz is our notation for the set of congruence classes. And the congruence classes, you have zero plus mz, one plus mz, two plus mz, all the way up to m minus one plus mz. So they're exactly m congruence classes modulo m. So the size or cardinality two words that mean the same thing, of uh, the set Z mod MZ is M. Right? Z mod MZ consists of M congruence classes. Each congruence class is an infinite set of numbers, but if we take the integer Z, it's partitioned into M pairwise disjoint congruence classes. And we proved that addition and multiplication of congruence classes is well-defined. So we defined, if you take the congruence class A plus MZ and the congruence class B plus MZ, we defined the sum to be the congruence class of A plus B plus MZ. And if you take the congruence class A plus MZ and the congruence class B plus MZ and you multiply them, 
Well, we find define multiplication to be the congruence class of AB plus MZ. And this is a well-defined multiplication. It doesn't matter which numbers A and B in the congruence class you choose to define the sum and the product. And we showed that Z mod MZ is a commutative ring. So let's recall the definition. A ring R is a set with two operations, addition and multiplication, whatever that means. I mean, they're just two operations. We give them these names with the following properties. So R zero, uh, A, so R is an abelian group under addition. That is, if you just look at the operation of addition in R, it satisfies all the axioms to be an abelian group. Second, multiplication is associative, which means in the group, if you have three elements, x, y, and z, x, y times z is x times y, z. Sorry, in the ring for all x, y, and z in the set R. Second, there exists a multiplicative identity, I'll call it one, such that for every x, one times x or x times one is x for all x and r. And three, we have a distributive laws. We have a distributive law You take x times y plus z, that's x, y plus x, z. And also if you multiply y plus z times x, that's y, x plus z, x. So any set with addition and multiplication defined that satisfies these four properties is called a ring, period, and A ring R is commutative if the multiplication is commutative. That is, x y equals y x for all x and y in R. So that's the definition of a ring. Groups and rings are the two fundamental objects in algebra, and. Z mod MZ is a commutative ring. The multiplicative identity is the congruence class of one. And so you notice we didn't say the multiplication formed a group, um, a multiplicative group, because it doesn't. But because not every element has an inverse. So let R be a commutative ring. An element U in R is called a unit if it has a multiplicative inverse, if there exists an element V in R such that UV and VU equals one. So that's what we call a unit in a ring. A unit's an element 
which has a multiplicative inverse. There's some V such that V is like one over U, U times V is one. And if um, UV equal VU equals one, and there's some other elements say U prime, such that UV prime equals V prime U equals one, then what can we say? So then V is V times one. I can write one as U times V prime. By associativity, this is V U times V prime. V U is one times V prime is V prime. So V is the same as V prime. So the inverse of a unit is unique. And we can write u prime as the inverse of a u of u. So if you have a unit, its inverse is unique, and so I can just call it u inverse. And we let r times be the set of all units in R. And I claim R star is a multiplicative group. So let's see, why is that true? R star is the set of all units in R. So if uh, U and V are units, then if I take U, V and they're units, so V has an inverse and U has an inverse. So if I take u v times v inverse u inverse, that's u v v inverse u inverse. This is one, so this is u u inverse. And u u inverse is one. And if I do the same calculation in the opposite order, I also get one. So therefore, if u and v are units, u times v is a unit so this set of units is closed under multiplication. And one is one times one is certainly a unit. So this contains the multiplicative identity. And um, if u is a unit, then u inverse is also a unit plus u times u inverse is one. So this is a abelian group under multiplication. So, our star is called the group of units of R. This is for any ring. So for example, suppose you take R to be the integers with the usual addition and multiplication. What are the units in R? What, else, what integers have the property that if you multiply it by some other integer, you get one? Can someone tell me? Can you repeat the question? Yes. Take the integers, one, two, three, minus one, and all those. Mm -hmm. What are the units? What integers have the property so find A and Z such that there is a B in Z with A times B equal one. What integers have the property, have this property? Maybe one. Right, so one certainly does because one times one is one. Two. What? Two. Two, what do you multiply two by to get one? Mm -hmm. Two times one. Two times one is two, it's not one. Yeah, I know. And then we subtract by one. Sorry? 
Oh, we didn't. I thought that we can subtract it by one. You're not subtracting, you're multiplying. This is multiplication. Given a number A, find a number B such that when you multiply them, you get one. So can you solve the equation two times B equal one in the integers? I don't think so. No, of course not. This is even, this is odd. It's not possible, right? Two times any integers and even integers, never one. So, so sorry, Professor. Negative one times negative one is one. So. Sorry, say that again, please. Negative one times negative one. Excellent. So negative one times negative one is one. So negative one is also a unit. Are there any others? No. That's it. So for the integers, the only units are plus or minus one. Okay. We can ask the same question in the ring of congruence classes. Suppose I take Z mod 4Z. What congruence classes are units? So zero is never a unit because zero times anything is zero, it's not one. But if you have one plus 4Z times one plus 4Z, that's one plus 4Z. So one unit is one plus 4Z. If you take three plus four Z and multiply it by itself, you get nine plus four Z, but nine is congruent to one mod four. So this is also a unit. What about two plus four Z? Is, can you multiply this by something? and get one plus four Z. That would mean that two B plus four Z equals one plus four Z. That would mean that two B is congruent to one mod four. And this is impossible because one is not congruent to zero modulo the greatest common divisor of two and four. So in Z mod 4Z, there are also two units. Professor? Yes. Can you go back to uh, the second line where you get like uh, at the end one plus, now uh, the last equation, the last one, yeah. Nine plus 4Z is one plus 4Z? Yeah. How okay, well, nine is congruent to one, mod four, is that okay? Yeah, okay, I see. So nine plus four Z equals one plus four Z. This is everything congruent to nine, this is everything congruent to one, but since nine and one are congruent, they're exactly the same sets. So again, you need to spend some time thinking hard about what it means to be a congruence class, but this is exactly what it means. Let me do one last example. Suppose P is a prime. You take Z mod PZ. So if A plus PZ is not zero mod P, that means A is not congruent to zero mod P. So we proved there exists an X such that AX is congruent to one mod P. If A and P are relatively prime. This has a congruence as a solution, which means the congruence class of A times the congruence class of X equals the congruence class of one. In other words, this is a unit. So the group of units in the congruence classes mod P, it's all the congruence classes 
<coughs> where A is not zero. So that means that every non-zero congruence class modulo a prime is a unit in Z mod PZ. And a ring where every non-zero element is a unit is called a field. And so Z mod PZ is what we call a field. A ring where every non everything is the unit except zero, which is never a unit. Any questions about this? Is this a question will be in the exam? Sorry? Is this question will be in the exam? Maybe, I don't know, I haven't made up the exam. But you know, the answer to the question, what's going to, what do you have to know for the exam is everything that we've covered. But this is very important. Uh, the connection between congruences and rings and fields is very, very important in algebra. Okay, well, I said I would have to stop uh, before 10 o'clock today and it's just before 10 o'clock. So that's all we're going to do uh, today. And um, I see someone just entered, which is just in time for us to leave. So I will uh, post this on Blackboard and um, I will get, have a second review sheet, which I add to the first review sheet uh, sometime on Friday, I think. I remind you the exam, the first midterm is one week from today and Monday is review. And I might have uh, some other times when I'm available on Zoom if you have questions uh, for additional review. Okay. All right, well, uh,